Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Teach Middle East podcast. My name is Lisa Grace. Today, I have Patrick McGrath with me, and we're talking inclusive education. What does inclusion mean to you as a teacher? What does it look like in your school? And what does it look like in your classroom? We're going to dive in and look a little bit more on a practical side, giving you some tips and strategies. Patrick is an experienced educationalist, and he's offering you and me some insight into what we can do to make sure that we're being truly inclusive, not only in our school as a general thing, but really specifically in our day-to-day work as classroom teachers. Welcome, Patrick. Thank you very much for the invite. It's lovely to be here, Lisa. It's great to have you. Oh, gosh, I can't get over that nice little Irish accent. I, just, <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, a, you... As I said to you earlier, it's a little bit raspier than it normally is um, uh, uh, due, due to some recent events. So, uh, yeah, I apologize for that. No, no, no need to apologize. Um, can you introduce yourself to our audience? Let them know a little bit more about Patrick before we dive into this conversation. Absolutely. Well, well, there's the first question. Some people call me Patrick. Some people call me Patty. That's a very Irish thing. And so you feel free. So some people will know me in either of those two ways. But I'm, I'm Patrick McGrath. And my, I have a... An odd job title. I'm a head of education strategy for EMEA for a company called Texthelp, which is based in Belfast. And most people know Texthelp for assistive technology tools. But I am I have the great privilege of working there and across EMEA, really being able to on my day-to-day job talk about teaching and learning and talk about specifically through the lens of technology in a lot of cases, how technology can impact on inclusion, on accessibility. And I can really make things count. So like you, Lisa, um, I'll host the odd podcast or two. You'll hear me at keynotes um, on international schools. You'll hear me in the region. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to getting back to the region soon. So, yeah, that's me. Brilliant. I, I, I really do um, like the fact that you not only are on the commercial end, but you do have that education part to the work that you do. And, and, and that is what we're going to be diving into a little bit today Absolutely. on the podcast. Brilliant. What's inclusion, Patrick? Or Patty? Wow. Wow. <laughs> There's the big question. That could be the full podcast there, Lisa. I, you know, I, I think inclusion in general, I think we have to recognize when we want to explain inclusion that, that all of our classrooms are diverse. And that is diverse in so many different ways. I mean, I would talk mostly about special education needs and how we might include those, but we have to open up the inclusion discussion to genuinely include everybody. And the first step is recognizing that every single pupil in our classroom is different. Now, that may be special education needs. um, That may be needs that we don't even see in the classroom. It may be their background at home. It may be culture. It may be religion. It may be anything different about that individual, individual child underneath our care. Um, And for me, the first thing is recognizing that that's a fact. And the second thing, and it is in all our classrooms, and the second thing is then making a conscious decision that we want to include everybody. And that sometimes, I suppose, Lisa, when I talk about it, can come across as a little bit contentious with some teachers, because most teachers, let's face it, as you know, how we work and why we do what we do, we say, well, we're inclusive. But the system sometimes hasn't been built for inclusion. And the system hasn't been built for inclusion because we need to, in a very busy classroom, as much as we can, we need to differentiate, yes, but actually the bulk of what we do is a one size fits all. And it's actually quite quite difficult to make sure we include every single pupil every single step of the way. So inclusion for me is having the uh, structure on how we design learning, having the understanding of the fact that there might be invisible barriers to learning that we don't see and making a conscious effort to make sure that every child is included from both the teaching perspective and the learning perspective. Yeah, I think you might have touched on it, but in your experience, what do you see schools getting wrong when it comes to inclusion? I know there could be a raft of things, but what comes to mind? What, what are they getting wrong? Yeah, I think I think it is that it's it's two things for me, it, one of which is recognition that everybody's different. I think that's really, really important because what traditionally we have we have intended to do, or sorry, not intended to do and have actually ended up doing is almost segregated individual special needs when we think about it. So we say, right, as an example, here are the dyslexic pupils in my class. I might have two dyslexic pupils, three, four, whatever the number happens to be. So what I need to do is I need to give them 
a special tool or I need to give them a computer or I need to give them a teaching assistant. And by trying to include them, we've made them different. So mm. that's one thing. And that's inadvertent. It's not intentional because we're all genuinely trying to help give them specialist support. But that does make them feel different and not necessarily included. And, and I suppose if you think about it, the second thing is that we all, particularly as classroom teachers, you know, have a great admiration and respect for our senkos and our send officers in our schools. They have very specialist knowledge. They are, uh, by and large, very well trained, and they have really, really, really strong experience dealing with pupils that have an individual need. And the challenge with that for all of us is we're not experts in that as a, as a standard classroom practitioner. So we tend to always defer and not necessarily always understand the individual needs of a pupil. And so I suppose to a degree, we, we're, we're a little bit afraid of it because somebody else takes that role and responsibility. And that's kind of how do we cross the bridge, make those pupils more included? And then how do we actually skill ourselves up to go, well, what bit as a classroom teacher can I do that supports the Senko, that supports those children? And so those are a couple of things, I suppose, that are legacy from how we've, how, you know, how, how we've all been taught to teach. Yeah, we're going to we're going to definitely talk a lot about the how. So if you're listening to this podcast, don't click away now because we're going to get into the how. I think teachers are fully aware of the what and the why, but the how they want. They want that support with how to actually be truly inclusive. But before we get into that is something you said earlier about the fact that we tend to put labels and then we try to help. So we might label a child dyslexic um, out of goodwill. Like we're not trying to be harsh. We're not yeah. trying to hurt. We're trying to make provision. And then we try to put things in place for that child, which actually makes that child now feel a little bit um, different from all the other children because they notice, you know, children are very sensitive and they're quite smart. So they know that, oh, I'm getting this. So that means there's something wrong or something different about me. Um, And so it's difficult really for schools. Um, How do they make provision then without stigmatizing or without making um, the child that they need to provide for feel different? How do they do that? I think that starts and it, it sounds like a big challenge, like a big hill to climb when I when I say it like I'm going to say it, but it starts at the very start of how you design your approaches to learning and and a very practical thing for a classroom teacher is how you might design or use your resources. So so let me give you an example of that. If you had a, a pupil, for example, who was visually impaired, so the, in order to help the pupil potentially read resources that the rest of the class uh, uh, may access, it may be a case of an advanced, there's advanced preparation goes on and we give that pupil um, a, you know, a large font size piece, heavily spaced lines. We give it to them on a larger size paper or perhaps we give it to them on a computer. So that takes preparation, that takes time, but it also means that you may well have 29 children in your class looking at the same resource and one pupil that you genuinely have just tried to help actually has a, a completely separate resource. So they're, they're starting to feel different, even though they should be the same. So from a practical standpoint, how could we do that? If we look at very carefully making sure that we just do some very simple changes to say our digital resources, you know, our our PDFs or our Word documents or our online tools that we might use, I'm talking digitally through digital tools, we can actually give the same resource to a pupil who is dyslexic, to a pupil who has no obvious barriers, to that visually impaired pupil. And actually nobody then feels different. Why? Because they have the control to change that resource around and do what they need to do that helps support them. So there are very practical ways we can put a place. But for me, it all starts at the very beginning. It starts with an understanding that we need to universally design what we're doing. We need to make sure that 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 resource or that video or that tool that we're using actually can be accessed by the widest range of pupils. And suddenly we can start to include them in those small steps. And I think those small steps are really, really crucially important. Yeah, I think I think what you said is really key is is that there are tools and there are ways to do it. But what springs to mind, I kind of think back of when I taught and I had 30 students in my classroom. They all had varying needs, varying differences. And I have to be honest with you, I struggled with how do I actually cater to each and every one of them? And I'm sure that's what teachers are thinking right now, listening to the pod. How do I do it? How do I ensure that my students are all catered for? Um, 
And I know you talked about learning design. So I want to touch on learning design because I think a lot of it really does come down to how we design the learning. What are some, you know, changes, some small things that we can do? You mentioned one. What are some others that we can do to design learning to cater to all our students? You take, so let's, let me, let me give you two, Lisa, actually, and I'll give you, the first one is just building on, on the last thing we talked about where I said, you know, that's digital resources and then digital resources in a flexible way, people can change. Mm -hmm. But let's think about that. Let's think about the next time we might go, I'm going to write a book good or a worksheet and it's a digital piece and I'm going to just do it in Microsoft Word, right? And that's all I'm going to do. So small things that you could do there. You could simply change the font to something like a Lexan font, which is going to help all of your pupils and is going to help your dyslexic pupils in particular. So just changing the font size starts to suddenly help more students in very subtle but very, very important ways for readability. Just increasing the space in between lines, it's one click, select all in one click, starts to help the readability of that. That could be just a pupil in your class that is simply struggling with that particular passage or it could be a, a, a pupil with more complex needs. You know, the titles we all put in, and I am as guilty of it as anybody, and it's really hard habit to break. You put a title in and you'll say earthquakes is the title. So what do you do to make it a title? Well, you'll put it in, you know, font size 18 and you'll maybe bold it out. Instead of on the menu, just put that as an H1 or an H2 title. That means that if a pupil needs, say, a text-to-speech tool or a screen reader or something like that to help them read it out loud, it knows that that's a header and it reads it out accordingly. Those are just three really, really, really tiny things we can do. And, you know, there's another simple thing which sounds so odd when you hear it first. You're like, really? When we have all written our emails or we've written communications to pupils or we've written resources and we've linked into a web page, for example. So we say, for some further reading, click here, right? Click here. We can't do that because that's not accessible. That doesn't help any student because somebody who needs that read aloud doesn't know what's behind the click here. So just say, click this page about earthquakes and describe it there is really good. So look, those are those are really small practical things, but those are things that literally you and I, Lisa, if we were teaching still, could go away tomorrow and just do those. They're just habits. They're just new habits we need to form. But if you don't mind me going on to another more wider bit, um, universal design for learning scares a lot of people. But if you think about, say, some of the new KCA um, documentation in and around uh, pupils of determination and the fact that universal design for learning is key to their learning going forward. Why is that the case? Well, universal design, design for learning is just a framework. It's not a set of rules anybody's going to tell you. But at least in your school, you must do all of these 27 things. Because if I said that to you, you'd be like, I don't have the time. I, I'm, I'm stressed. There's too much workload. But what it does say in very general terms is, what you need to do is give pupils access to a wider range of resources, right? So all we're saying is give them the ability to watch something as well as read something as a very basic example. But also when it comes to things like assessment, more so articulate and learning, it's like, well, is it okay that you're asking your entire body of pupils to, I don't know, complete a worksheet or do a task on an online environment that you're asking them to complete or, or run through some rote practice in mathematics on four, four pages? Or can you give those same pupils the opportunity to pursue the same goal, which is in maths, learn the quadratic equation, right? So that may be, they may want to do a slide. Deck. They may want to record a video. Lisa, they may want to do a podcast like this, but to give them the opportunity and the flexibility is one of the most important things we can do. UDL as a simple structure is a really good way to start and go, okay, so you're saying I just need to give out multiple resources, but teachers don't have to do that. And, and that may sound like a contradiction, but in the digital world, if you give a pupil out a Word document, okay, and you give them a set of technology tools, then those technology tools could turn that into an audiobook or can have it read out loud, or they could use dictation that's built in the type instead of using the keyboard. There's loads of ways that if you empower pupils with a whole range of tools, any technology tools that are out there that can help in the classroom, many can do these things. They can start to be the masters of themselves, but we need to start at the start. 
long answer I know and you, you haven't given me the head tilt yet Lisa so I'm no 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 because I'm enjoying your response I, I I told Patrick guys listening to the podcast I told him if I give him the head tilt if you're not watching this on YouTube and you're listening to me <laughs> on um, Spotify or Apple or all of the other um, platforms that we're on the head tilt means my guests are talking too much and so need to stop but I didn't give him the head tilt because I was learning so much about UDL and I was like okay so here's my here's because it sounds really really simple except it also sounds like it requires a lot of thinking and planning and prep and we all know how you know, difficult it is for teachers to find enough time. Are there yeah. any tips or time-saving tips that you have that can help while planning this for the inclusive classroom? Yeah, I mean, my advice when you're starting to think about UDL, because it it is a sea change. So universal design for learning is right. I need to be more inclusive from the start. So I need to make that decision. It then is, what are the steps that I need to take in my classroom or maybe even at a whole school level? That we need to do right so it sounds like there's much more planning i always say start with very very basic things you see what i talked about earlier about simple things in terms of how a document is formatted that is part of udl that is a way to make that more accessible but think about other things if you've ever used a powerpoint or a slide deck in your classroom right and you you happen to have it on the board and you're talking through you're introducing a new topic whatever it happens to be as part of your lesson one way to increase access to that and be more UDL is to just switch on the closed captions on your computer. Just switch on closed captions. Now, if you think about that, very, very small change. Your computer's picking up your microphone. You haven't had to do anything. You've had to press one button. Suddenly, there are pupils in the class, maybe multilingual pupils. That could help. It may be pupils with an individual need. That could help. Um, it may well be pupils actually, like me, frankly, I quite enjoy just reading as I'm listening to people because it helps me comprehend better and take it in quicker. So you've helped so many different people by saying, I am giving you alternative. You can listen to me at the start. You can listen to me and you can read the words on the screen. We've all done it on our, on our TV channels and we know the strength that that has for all sorts of different reasons. The other thing you could do, um, say you're talking through a resource on the interactive whiteboard or your projector or you're doing something online, just use something simple. And you, you know, I'm not here to plug anything, but I'm going to mention one tool, which is a tool called Screencastify. I have no affiliation with them whatsoever. I don't even know the people there. But Screencastify, as an example, in one button, lets you record what's happening on the screen. Now, why would that be important? Well, as a teacher, you've just had to press the button. It's all you've had to do. Literally, you haven't had to make any changes to lessons whatsoever. You do what you do really well, but you press this button. The important thing is that automatically produces a recording. People say you need to rewind and re-listen to something, your explanation. They need to re-look at something that was discussed in the classroom or listen to it. They need to review a visual to help their understanding. Suddenly, it's all there. Some pupils will simply prefer to watch that and watch it again and again and again. Some pupils will ignore it. Some pupils will put their headphones in and not watch it, but listen to it. But the point is, by those tiny, simple changes, you've made a huge amount of choice suddenly available to your pupils. So there's lots and lots and lots of exciting things that are really basic and just take a button. You need to know they're there, first of all, and you need to remember to press the button. And those are really, really good ways to start. And, I, you know, I, Lisa, talk a lot about trying to get us all as educators to form new habits. And I, and I talk about that because... Habits are generally quite small things, and but they're small things that can make a big difference. But the beauty of a habit is they tend to then end up being quite subconscious. You know, you if you do the closed caption thing, you know, the next few times that you happen to be using a PowerPoint or, a, or or something on your screen, you'll probably start to do that far more regularly without even thinking about it. It's just what you do. You put, put it on the screen, you go over, you sink your pen, and you press the closed captions button, and you're off. So yeah. these habits, I think, are really important. Lots of things like that. Yeah, I, I do. I do agree with you about forming the habit. And once you have that in place, then you can automatically get that doing. Something I thought about while you were talking, um, we tend to think about inclusive education as it relates to special education needs or students who need extra support, students who need extra help. But what about the students who are gifted and talented um, how do we adapt? How do we um, uh, include them 
in all of our planning and, and, and in the learning that's taking place in the classroom so that they're not bored out of their skulls, you know, frankly. No, absolutely. And that whole concept of stretch and challenge for me, um, I, I think is, is very, very important for those students. And there are ways that um, things like, say, say text-to-speech, we were talking about it earlier, um, text-to-speech can help those pupils be stressed and challenged more, say, for something simple as exam practice, just tightening up on their answers. Now, those are tiny ways that can help them. It can help them with revision and study. There's loads of technology tools that can do that. Um, but I think if you start to think about inclusion and the path to inclusion, and how we might give opportunities to stretch and challenge our high achievers. One of the things there that um, UDL will talk about, actually coming back to UDL is an interesting parallel because UDL will talk a lot about goals. And, and what, when I talk about this, I like to talk about the ski map. And for those of you who've been skiing, you get a ski map and you go, right, my first goal is to get to the top and my next goal is to get to the bottom. But the ski map, for any of you who have seen one, will give you multiple routes down to that bottom piece. Some are more complex, some are more challenging. You know, the black slopes are, you know, are something I would never do because they're complex slopes to do. But I would take the nursery slopes every single time. I need some support, you know, I'm really not an expert. And if you think about moving your learning to pure goal-based and not have a prescriptive way to get to that goal, to say, right, this is the process we're taking to get to that goal. If you think about the goal as the bottom of that of that of that um, of that mountain, that means that you can give those pupils multiple paths to do it, and you know what it's like. If you've ever met, maybe you're one of them, Lisa, but if you've ever met a really really good skier, what do they want to do? They want to push themselves. They want to stretch. They want to go on the on the harder slopes to hit. That's what tends to happen if you give pupils the choice to reach a goal. They tend to drive themselves further. But again, that's all about for me. I, I talk a lot about, you know, choice and voice. I say, and, and I think those are really important for our pupils. But actually, the one thing that's missing when we talk about choice and voice is another word, which is opportunity. So we can set these goals all day long. We can do these resources. We can focus on UDL. But if we don't give our pupils the opportunity to embrace these new things that we're doing and we're talking about and new processes, then we'll never achieve the inclusion bit and as you rightly said in the question, that absolutely includes a pupil with individual or special needs or pupils of determination or, or a pupil or student that we really want to drive on because they, they're, they're, they're super talented. So inclusion is absolutely as much about them, but you know, we've got to give everybody the opportunity. Yeah. Is there, is there a theory called opportunity-based learning? No, but there probably should be. I think because while you were this. talking, I'm thinking, what, maybe we need to do some research into that because goal-based learning, I haven't learned, I haven't heard of. Opportunity-based learning, I haven't heard of. But but there is something there. I'm not a researcher. I'm not a, a an ed researcher by any stretch, but I think there should be some research into what effect it would have on students if we simply um, provided them with the opportunities to reach the goals yeah. that have been said and not be so prescriptive um, in the way they should do it or even prescriptive on the results they should get. Yeah. Because there is something to, to be said about having that goal, presenting the opportunity and then letting the learning be organic and the result be organic and also the failure Absolutely. and the relearning and, and that entire process. But that, uh, that is quite scary for, you know, you've been in the classroom, Lisa, and, and the teachers that you work with, that letting go is the scariest part. <clears throat> that really, really is. And, you know, it's, we've seen it happen even over the last couple of years um, where, you know, through our periods of remote learning, so many teachers did so many incredible things when it came to technology. They engaged with pupils in a different way, partly because they had to, but also because <clears throat> they wanted to do these things. And we, we all have to step back and ask ourselves a question, that engagement, that interactivity, that inclusion, did we all just get back into school and go, well, actually, now we're face to face again. You know, we don't need to do those those challenging things. So the opportunity may have temporarily went away a little bit, but you're absolutely right, Lisa. We do need to pursue that, need to pursue that model. And that, like we, we've seen it before. I've been working with schools around the world, you know, now for what, 15 years on, on, on their digital strategies as an example. 
And one thing that happened time and time again, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. One thing that happened time and time again was devices, digital devices went in and new, new approaches to pedagogy where technology underpinned learning went in. And when you reevaluated it a year later, there was there was a reticence from the classroom to kind of keep that keep that moving it was seen as quite new and so that opportunity thing you've talked about it's it's probably easy to get started and quite hard to maintain the momentum but that is the most critical thing that it, as leaders and as educators any of us can do is just keep that momentum going because opportunity leads to more opportunity i'm convinced of that and really gets the most out of our pupils I've made a note of this whole goal-based learning and opportunity-based learning is something I'm going to look at later on to see what's you're, out you're not there. Allowed, you're not allowed to use my analogy of the ski map now, Lisa, okay? So next time we talk about it, that's mine. I am 100% I am stealing that. Be, be informed, Patrick, that is stolen. Because if you think about presenting varying paths to how you get to a destination and just allowing students to organically choose the path they, they want or they think they can, yeah. they can manage, um, but all leading to the destination, um, the yeah. same destination, fabulous. If you think about that in terms of classroom, that is very, very, very powerful. Because it means as a teacher, when I sit down to plan my lesson, I know exactly where I want my students to be, right? Yeah. So that could yeah. be the, the outcome, the learning outcome that we're working towards, okay? Yeah. But I don't have to dictate to them how they get to that outcome. I'm pretty much providing them with the tools. So if the analogy should, should still stand, I'm giving them their skis, I'm giving them the right gear. I'm making sure they're they're starting at the right place, right? Yeah. And then I'm allowing them to get to that destination the way they see fit. Yeah. It's fabulous. Like we could even just wrap up the podcast right now and go, <laughs> go get your students some ski map kind of learning and let's uh, let us know how they got to their destinations, because we're also not telling them how swiftly or how soon they need to get to that destination. We're giving them the freedom to get there at their pace. Absolutely. And isn't that truly what inclusion is all about, really, when you get right down to it? No, it, it absolutely is. Lisa, it's providing that flexibility. And one of the things actually just, you know, for your listeners um, on this episode um, is there's there's, that may sound like a scary thing. You know what you've talked about and I've talked about, whoa, right, let's collapse it and let's make it goal-based. And there's been lots, there have been lots of initiatives in the past, like challenge-based learning and problem-based learning. And they are fabulous when you see them, but they're very hard to get up and running because you're asking a huge big question rather than an actual intention of the learning. And you're, you're, you know, everything's a project based and it's quite hard to see how that fits in the curriculum. But there are lots of really small resources that can fit in between to move to goal-based learning. And um, uh, I'm uh, from Ireland, as you you talked about at the outset. So I refer to it differently for any anybody who's taught or grown up in America, uh, they'll talk about tic-tac-toe. And in the UK, where I grew up effectively, we called it axiosis, but it's the same thing. It's that square and we all put an X or a zero to get the three. Now there you're going, why is he talking about tic-tac-toe? Well, tic-tac-toe grids are a really useful way and you can google this and i'm quite happy to send any of your listeners any of these things but they're a really lovely way to illustrate how we might provide more choice but not that scary open-ended choice for goal-based learning because basically you've got to get from one side of the grid to another as as a pupil and it's a nice way to get pupils thinking about well hold on a minute my teachers just told me i've got to get from here to here and they've given me all the tools well what actually does do they want me to do? Um, and now you can start to map those out really easy. So there's there's all sorts of structures. I could obviously talk about this all day. If I still had a voice, Lisa, I could talk <laughs> about it all day. Um, but there's lots of ways that it doesn't have to be as scary as collapse everything, move to goal-based learning, and that's the ultimate. But there are lots of stepping stones to get teachers there. Yeah, I, I when when we were talking about it, I didn't think we should collapse everything, but I do think that it's a way in which we can 
still operate within yeah. the remit of what's required by the authorities and the powers that be. Yeah. You, 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 you said something earlier talking about what teachers did during the distance learning and the pandemic um, and about how they adopted technology and how they really did some creative things. And then going back to face-to-face -to -face learning, how some of that might be lost. The problem isn't that, I, I genuinely believe that the problem isn't that teachers wanted to lose these fantastic things that they actually started, um, but that the pressures came back yeah. that were always there. And so it forced them to go back into the mold that they were in previously. So it's, it's almost, if you think about it like potty, do you, do you play with potty? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and you take it out of wherever and you reshaped it and it's nice and fluffy, but then you've got to get it back into this particular jar. So you, it, yeah. it goes right back into that shape. And I, and I almost think that the analogy is exactly what, what happened with teachers. Uh, and, and so even though teachers are working very, very hard to have this inclusive classroom, et cetera, there are so many factors that come at them that it's it's quite hard to fluff out yeah. and 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 really show all the different shapes that you can be. Um, let's move into another segment then. So we talked a little bit about GNT. We talked about special education needs, but I want to talk about an inclusive classroom from the point of including every child in there in terms of race, background, ethnicity, um, making sure that they're represented in every facet of the classroom and that their particular needs are being taken into consideration. How do you see teachers doing that when there's such a variety and a diversity of people and pupils within the space? I, I think, you know, it comes way back to the very beginning, Lisa, where we talked about a recognition that everybody's different in, in, in their own way. We, we have to recognize that. And if we recognize that, We've got to start focusing very much on our language, on our turn of phrase, on our unconscious bias that are there. And many of us don't want to admit that they're there. Um, and that's the whole point, unconscious bias. But I think we need to go wider than that. You know, we need to examine the resources we use and the way that we talk and the cultural representations that are there and in place in those. Um, UDL, you know, when we talked earlier, also includes that. It's not just about individual special needs, you know all cultures and languages should be recognized within there also. But also I think we've got to recognize and particularly in the Middle East, um, they said that, you know, the, the diversity of languages that may well be in some of the schools there, recognizing that that is an identity and a culture and a voice that absolutely deserves to be heard equally with every other voice in the classroom. But we, we it's, it's a, for me, it's a part of recognizing that and just making sure that our resources and our approaches and our language that we form is representative of everybody in that room. And that, that is difficult. Um, but it, for me, it starts at the beginning. It starts with recognizing that everybody's different and that everybody everybody has a voice, um, really key. But I would also add to that, and it touches also on the point you made earlier about you know the putty plasticine fitting into the model again. You know, our leaderships in our schools um, and even a policy level have to really be on board with that every bit as much as they have to be on board with, say, the individual special needs. We, we see policy around special needs. We see um, uh, specialist funding around special needs. And I'm not saying for one second that that's not right and proper. It absolutely is. But we don't see the same level of focus around policy and funding. And for my mind, leadership in and around you know the wider point of inclusion in schools, it's getting there. But it's getting there too slowly for me. Um, and it needs it needs to go faster, and it needs to be on an equal foot to, um, uh, to to all the other areas of inclusion we put in. Yeah, no, I do agree with you. I think there is a, a lack of urgency um, yeah. in in some of those areas, especially when it comes to providing resources that reflect the diversity that exists in the classroom. Um, many teachers are really searching. Um, for resources that represent a wide array of pupils, because that's exactly who sat in front of them. And they don't really exist. They, I mean, they, they just, they're not there. Um, and, and, and I should say also that there is a responsibility, and you mentioned at the outset, you know, 
well, Patrick's kind of commercial, but he's not commercial, thankfully. But I should say that there is a responsibility on commercial companies out there and every commercial company that, that you know, that wants to sell their wares to, to school, that wants to, you know, license a teacher, a subscription to, a, you know, a resource download area or wants to come in and sell to a whole school. There is a huge and heavy, heavy duty on their shoulders to do exactly the same. We cannot expect our classroom teachers and our leaders to take the responsibility solely for this. You know, you know, schools rely on ed tech and resource companies and, you know, on textbook companies just as much. And there's a huge responsibility there. And, you know, those companies, I mean, I include ourselves in that, have to absolutely pick that up. Yeah, I do. I do also wonder as well, in terms of the provision of resources, is if companies are understanding that it is beneficial to their bottom line, because you know, nothing speaks to a company more than their bottom line. <laughs> if <laughs> Tell them, oh, it's really good for you to make sure your resources are inclusive. But if you tell them by having inclusive resources, you will affect your bottom line in a positive way. Maybe they'll listen. I, I don't know. What do you, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, yes, but if you're a truly inclusive company, that actually should be quite natural to you. Do you know, mm. it really should. It should not be about the bottom line. I mean, you know, in, in what we do in Texas, we'll you know we'll add in minority voices, for example, in there because we've been asked for a minority voice, you know, a playback voice in a certain country. Those are really important, and you can't judge that and say well, how much is that worth to a company to do that? Because you literally may have made a massive change, you know, for 50 students in one international school, so or three international schools somewhere. But those are very, because every child is important within that. Every child deserves a voice. And so you're right. Um, but I think you, like all things in that, I see you, you run the risk of that balance of, of companies doing it for the wrong reasons, which are the money reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and doing it for tokenistic reasons. And yes, they're all driven by that, of course. You know, everybody's there to make money. I un totally understand that. Um, but I really like to see the industry shape up to do it for the right reasons. It's yeah, just, we, just we, we, should. We, sh we should. We should see them doing it for the right reason. Um, I'm sorry, I, I might come off pessimistic, but I'm ugh. if they were supposed to do it for the right reasons, why haven't they done it? They yeah. should have by now. I mean, come on, it's 2022. Let's 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 take it away from that and talk a little bit about something that we kind of sort of touched on earlier, the language that we use in our classroom, how to ensure our language is inclusive, because it's so important. I think sometimes we unknowingly use language that excludes students. Um, and we really, as teachers, ought to really be intentional and examine the language we use. What are some things that are being said that shouldn't be said and how can they be said differently? I, I think for me, I, I treat this probably at an oversimplistic level, Lisa, and, and I go, I really sort of evangelize about just lack of labels. And for me, that is the most important thing because if I'm thinking about how I'm talking to a set of teachers or a set of leaders at a, a keynote session or on a podcast like this, I'm always thinking about how can I give them small bits of advice that, that, that they can actually properly check as they talk and think things through. And for me, labels is important. And I start with very simple things like, I, for those of you who are watching this, and Lisa, you, you're obviously watching it, but I wear glasses. You'll see that from my stunning picture that I'm sure Lisa's going to share. But I, I wear a pair of glasses. At no time in the last 30 years of me wearing glasses has anybody talked about my assistive glasses or my special glasses. I mean, yes, you know, 40 years ago when I first got them and I was, you know, in primary school, yes, people teased me about them. But outside of that environment, no, nobody ever in my day would say, how are your assistive glasses? Your, your new assistive glasses are really nice. But honestly, if I were to take these off now, Lisa, I cannot see you on the screen. I need these otherwise I cannot function on a daily basis. And many people are like that. But there's no label on my glass. They're just glasses. My my phone is not, I use it for maps. I use it to have things read aloud. Pupils with uh, an individual needs or pupils with determination will use it for assistive tools. But nobody says, how's your new assistive iPhone 13 doing? We need to drop labels because by doing that, we, you know, we drop stigma. Um, and I think also. We need to be very careful about the small things. You know, here's an example, dyslexia. 
do, does a pupil struggle with dyslexia? Like that's a tiny thing. You struggle with dyslexia and your response is a dyslexic. Well, no, I live with dyslexia. So for pupils living with dyslexia, you know, it's a tiny, tiny, tiny change, but a very important change. So dropping the labels for me is my overarching kind of thing because I, for me, it's easy for us to think about and just stop putting labels on everything around us. Assistive technology, you know, all of those things need to go away. Label, labels have to stop. Um, that's just going to segregate us and always carry a stigma when we put a label on anybody. And that, and that includes all across inclusion. Yeah, that is so, so true. I just looked at my time and I was oh, it, it's all good conversations always just get carried away. I think people <laughs> listening to this podcast always go, Lisa, you're always running over. What is wrong with you? But as the conversation is good, I just keep asking questions and keep learning. Um, you have to understand, listeners, I, I love to learn as well. So when I'm in these podcast episodes, I'm here to fill my brain up as much as I'm here to help <laughs> you fill your brains up as well. Um, Patrick, before we you know, get off this podcast, I wanted to just ask you, what is your hope for inclusion going forward in school? What is the one thing you want teachers to do right now if they if they're gonna stop listening to this podcast in another minute or two before they jump off you want them to grab a pen or a paper and write this one thing down what is that one thing well well it's always hard for me to do to do one thing i would encourage anybody to listen to some of the habits that we've talked about um, and just pick one of those things to do Ch change your documents tomorrow switch on your closed captions tomorrow just think about dropping labels. I'd love them to do all of those things, but I also understand classrooms are very busy and one thing at a time. But really the reason I do what I do and I would, you know, love talking to people like yourself, you know, who can give us some airtime is not to sell things, Lisa. It's not to talk about. And hopefully I haven't done that at any point. You know, it's it's that my goal here is, is that we actually never have a conversation about special needs. I don't want I want to talk about sand. That's a label. I don't want to talk about pupils of determination. That's a label. You know, these are labels and we need to get away from that and recognize that every single person in this world is different in every single way. We all approach learning differently. We all approach each other differently. And as, as teachers, we've got to just form those new habits we've talked about and we've got to adapt the practice and recognize that that's the case. And I firmly believe that all of those differences are, are superpowers. I, I genuinely believe that, that, you know, that what, what we used to say is, oh, suffer from dyslexia. And there used to be that face or, oh, from that background or, oh, well, and we're, we're kind of like, there's a negative connotation before we even start. It's actually, that child's dyslexic. Look what he can do. You know, that child is from that particular place. Look at them fly, you know, because these differences really, really make it. So start with remembering diversity is in your classroom. Every child is different. And next, move on to a decision that you're going to be more inclusive every day. And lastly, find one of those habits that we talked about and just run with it. And trust me, you'll see the difference. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Patrick. It's been a real pleasure. I think, I think I've actually learned... Um, a lot more about, you know, just some of the little things that we can do to ensure that our classrooms are, are, are just a bit more inclusive. Yeah. But I think what I'm going to take away from this is to go and look up, <laughs> has there been any research on opportunity-based <laughs> learning? And what can we do with that? And what's that scheme up analogy telling us that how can we really put that as a theory forward for learning within the classroom? You get, you'll get some credit on it, Patrick. I promise. <laughs> I promise. Okay. I will put a little credit in there. Listen, it's been brilliant. Thank you so much for joining us on the Teach Middle East podcast. Thank you, Lisa. It's been an absolute pleasure. I could have talked for hours. Thank you. See you again soon. See you.